So welcome everyone. I'd like to begin tonight's program by acknowledging and paying respect to the fact that we in Philadelphia are located on the lands of the Lenny Lenape people. My name is Leila Cartier. I am the executive director of Craft Now Philadelphia. Craft Now is in its seventh year of programming and we are thrilled to share this first Friday preview with you virtually. Since we have started doing these about a year ago, it has evolved into a kind of casual industry night where those working in the field can convene since many will eventually be returning to their galleries for First Fridays. But we also can expand beyond Old City Philadelphia with our presenters and the audiences we are able to reach just like we're doing here tonight. I'm going to take care of a little bit of housekeeping while everyone continues to sign on. I want to let you know that we have enabled the closed caption feature tonight with help from our friends at Disability Pride PA. So you can click on the CC button toward the bottom of your screen for the auto transcription. It will not be perfect, but I hope it's helpful for some of you. We are going to keep all of you on mute for now to avoid background noise while our presenters are talking. Please put any questions or comments that you have in the chat and toward the end of their presentation, we will filter through them and share them with the presenters. And at the very end, we're going to invite everyone to unmute themselves and close out the program with a little conversation. So I hope these remarks have given everyone a chance to settle in so we can begin. Joining us tonight is R and Company's Evan Snyderman in conversation with artists Anna Von Mertens and Jaden Moore. Some of you might recognize Evan as the son of Philadelphia's renowned craft gallerists, Ruth and Rick Snyderman. He will be leading tonight's program, which will explore the incredible work of Von Mertens and Moore, as well as R and Company's current exhibition, Objects USA 2020. This show surveys American handmade arts through a curated selection of 50 significant historical works and 50 works by some of the most impactful contemporary artists working today. So Evan, Anna, and Jaden, thank you for being here tonight and I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen here. Bear with me a second, here we go. Okay, hello everyone. It's great to um, be joining you tonight um, and it's a pleasure to be speaking to Craft uh, Now and the Philadelphia Contingency, which um, many of you may know that I, uh, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. And so it's great to have a connection to that incredible city, which has a deep history with the craft movement. And uh, I really have a lot of you know, credit to give for uh, you know, being brought up in that world and uh, has really allowed me to be where I am today. And, and not knowing uh, as a child, this is where I would end up. It's, it's pretty funny as we think about, uh, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I suppose. Um, but it's, uh, it's great to be able to talk about this subject, which is something uh, I feel I've, I've sort of more or less grown up within. Um, so we're going to start off with a little discussion, history of uh, my connection to the craft world, and then we'll get into uh, the discussion of Objects USA, the exhibition that's currently at R and Company in the gallery. Um, and then we're going to talk with Jaden Moore and Anna Von Mertens about their work and uh, what they're looking uh, to do and what's happening in their, their careers and, and everything else. It should be a fun discussion. Um, so we will um, start off with a very early slide here. So uh, a little background. Um, my mother started the Works Crafts Gallery in uh, Philadelphia on Locust Street, 1965 with a friend um, selling contemporary American crafts um, and also uh, Native American work and some uh, work from uh, various tribes in uh, Alaska, uh, Eskimo sculpture. Uh, so it, it was a really interesting start to uh, the gallery. Here you have a slide uh, of the interior of that show. There's not too many pictures of that interior, but it's great to see. Uh, I actually would 
love to ask them more questions. I haven't had a chance about who some of the artists are pictured here. Maybe we get into some of that um, later. Um, and in 1970, the year I was born, we moved to South Street. And on the right-hand side, you see a slide of the, the facade of the gallery. And on the left side, my father in the, in the works gallery. And I spent my entire childhood, essentially, we lived above the gallery um, for the first, I think, 16 years of my life or so. Um, and spent many of those years or summers traveling, visiting artists. I was exposed to some of the greatest uh, ceramicists, glass artists, textile artists of the time. Uh, it was just a normal part of our daily life. Um, artists were constantly staying with us at their homes or we would be staying with them in their homes. Um, and it was a, a really incredible place to, to see. And South Street at this time in Philadelphia was, of course, um, you know, the center of the Philadelphia art world. Um, there were galleries, cafes, theaters, performance art spaces. It was a very vibrant community. Um, and here's a couple of early um, invitations, which I found to be really interesting as well. Just it's great to see some of this history and I love history. And this is partly what, you know, as a gallery art and company, we've tried to really preserve a lot of the history of the, the design world throughout our careers. Um, and this, this is something that I find very uh, interesting to see this, uh, particularly the clay Manhattan invitation from the works gallery, which would have been in the early uh, 1970s and some of the artists listed there. Again, we have to do more research and discovering who some of them are um, and of course, here's an invitation for one of the early exhibitions of Roland Jan, uh, one of the first glass artists to be shown. This is also late 60s or early 70s, I would imagine. Um, incredible work. And then on the left-hand side, a statement written by the gallery, um, which I found also really interesting. I can read quickly. Um, we've lived a little bit of the lives of the craftsmen we represent. Uh, some are young students, some are experienced professionals, all share the desire to tell what they have learned. Let us share these experiences with you. Priced from $1 to 1200, you may choose from the fine American craft work, hand-built stoneware, porcelain, woodwork, macrame, hand-blown glass, jewelry weaving, metalwork, and sand cast constructions. Plus folk art from Poland, carvings of the Northwest Hudson's Bay Eskimo peoples, and apple-faced corn husks, of course. Um, so jumping ahead, um, you know, so, First Friday, which is again, really interesting to be connected to First Friday. Um, I had as an artist, my first three solo exhibitions um, in Philadelphia during First Friday events um, at the Pentimente Gallery was my first show. And then at the Rosenfeld Gallery. Um, so I, and, and, and after the Snyderman and Works Gallery moved from South Street, they moved to Old City and were one of the earliest galleries to establish, help establish the First Friday um, which is such an incredible, uh, you know, project and, and it continues to this day. Um, so today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about Objects USA. Um, so again, this show was something that I've sort of known about my whole life. The original copy of Objects USA, the catalog, which was published in 1970, uh, was always on our coffee table. Um, I felt like I, I, when I first started uh, my gallery, I... I had a copy of this book. I've been always searching through it and wondering, you know, who some of these artists were, where some of them were. Um, my, my business partner and I, uh, both of us came from the world of craft, both um, working in glass independently as artists. Uh, when we started our company, we had this idea to really want to engage with artists who were makers, who we, we understood the language, we understood how to talk about these things. Uh, and it's what excites us um, as dealers and to be able to have that connection and also share that knowledge with the clients that we work with. Um, so it's sort of like insider information that we've been able to share, which has really been helpful to create the gallery that we've created over all these years. Um, the Objects USA show has been on our radar forever. As I mentioned, we really wanted to um, do something around this, the, the, the 50th anniversary, which was supposed to be um, in 20, uh, 20, um, which would have been the year the book was published. And of course, with the pandemic, our exhibition ended up being pushed back about a year, which was fine. We needed every minute we had to actually pull it all together. Um, 
the original exhibition, which was curated by a man named Lee Nordness and a, uh, who was a contemporary art dealer at the time selling abstract expressions, paintings and uh, sculpture. And uh, the curator of the then American Craft Museum now called the Mad Museum, Paul Smith, um, together, the two of them curated one of the most influential and important craft exhibitions in history. Uh, that exhibition incorporated almost 300 artists. Uh, it opened at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC in 1969, 1970, and then it traveled to 33 museums around the country and then on to Europe and Japan. Um, so the, the, the breadth of that original exhibition was, was massive. Uh, it had been completely funded uh, and sponsored by the Johnson Wax family. A uh, man named Samuel Johnson, who was the founder, uh, commissioned essentially this exhibition and paid for all the works by the artists and then subsequently donated at the end of the run of the show to several of the institutions, the bulk of which going to the Mad Museum uh, or the American Craft Museum at the time, which was um, Paul Smith's museum, of course, that was his sort of payment for working on this project was acquiring all those works for their collection uh, and the rest going to the Racine. Um, Samuel Johnson had commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to build his, um, his factory and office tower, um, which is pretty extraordinary. So a very big patron of the arts, um, something that I would only dream of happening today to have a corporation um, sponsor something along this uh, level. For our uh, sort of 50th anniversary survey, we, we brought in, there was four of us who co-curated the exhibition, myself and Glenn Amundsen, um, Abby Bangser and James Amatis. And we decided to break the exhibition up into sort of uh, two parts in a way, inviting 50 contemporary artists and selecting 50 historical artists from the original exhibition. And then pairing them together throughout the, the show in a way to try to share uh, their histories, um, but also to uh, tell the story of where contemporary craft is today uh, and where it was 50 years ago and how this sort of hierarchy that has maybe established um, the, the, the differences between the fine art worlds and the design or the craft worlds over the last 50 years, how that hierarchy is starting to, to crumble, how it's starting to change and how we're now starting to see all these worlds converging, which is something that we have uh, really been passionate about um, achieving that and, and pushing that narrative forward um, throughout our entire careers as, as, as dealers. Um, so here you see a slide um, of uh, the gallery cur currently. Um, on the left-hand side is a piece by Serban Ionescu. Uh, and then to the right on the front of the red panel there is Woody DeAfeo. And behind, uh, all the way in the back, uh, Roberto Lugo. Philadelphia artists, many of you must know, and Anders Ruwald, the large sculpture in between. Um, we tried to create this exhibition. Uh, the exhibition design was really important. Um, I felt it really needed to have a kind of World's Fair feel to it, which is why we created these banners. We created a, a logo. The show has its own website. We created a, uh, a grassroots campaign for um, TikTok and for uh, Instagram, where artists can upload images of themselves working, which has been really a great way to connect to a, a larger community. So it was really about building the community around makers. Um, this slide, you see um, several artists work on the left hand side. Um, Joyce Lynn, this small table, she's the youngest artist in the current exhibition. Uh, it's called a skinned table. It's hard to see in this slide, but it's actually a small sort of found object uh, antique table of no great value in and of itself, but she's taken this, the veneer and, and razor bladed it off the skin of the surface and mounted it so that it's sort of exploded in a way. Um, to, the, to the white, the, the wall piece is um, by Tanya Akawina. I, I'm sorry, I'm probably butchering her last name because it's off. But Tanya is an amazing artist who works in, in textile and felt um, this piece is actually uh, has gold leaf and it has terracotta in, in, in embedded into the clay. And then um, a work by Tommy Simpson from 1966, uh, next to that a painted table. And on the right-hand side, Sheila Hicks. So 
here you have this really interesting mix of, you know, obviously the famous artists such as Sheila Hicks, one of the biggest names in, in contemporary art and uh, design um, today, um, one of the most influential figures in the textile world uh, with someone who's just starting their career. Um, again, the idea of being a very democratic exhibition with no pride of placement given to any particular artist, um, but the idea was to bring everyone together. Um, here we have a, a work by Sam Maloof um, and Daniel Loomis Valenza did this small cabinet um, and the chair by Green River Projects, a Brooklyn based design team uh, who also work in contemporary art worlds as well. Um, Hilder Johnson did the large textile and then on the shelf, John Souter, another Philadelphia artist, um, Thaddeus Wolf and Allison Siegel and, and uh, Allison uh, and Pamela Sambrosa. The, the chandelier above is by Rogan Gregory, one of our artists. So we, we really tried to build this exhibition that kind of goes through the entire gallery, all three floors. Um, in the lower gallery, here's a slide of uh, a wall work by Dana Barnes, a uh, coffee table by David Wiseman in bronze, and then this hanging sculpture by Jill Platner, who's a jeweler, but this is a 30 foot tall cast iron sculpture um, hanging in the gallery. So the show, I'll just say, is up until um, mid-September. Um, we're keeping the show up for a little bit longer than uh, planned. Who went hunting and did the board. We have um, a video of Anna Von Mertens. Um, this is uh, Anna. I'm going to introduce you now and let you talk a okay. little bit about uh, yourself and your work. Uh, Anna is one of the artists in the exhibition, and we'll see more of her work as we go through the slides. Um, but it's really wonderful to have you here with us. And uh, I would love you to talk about what you do because your process is so interesting and, and your work is so unique that we're thrilled to, to learn more about it. Great. Um, I'm laughing because this is, uh, you guys asked for a process video and this was the only one I had. The Redwick for the 40th anniversary made me make the one minute video. And I was, you know, those like um, dynamic process videos. I'm like, it's just stitching. I'm just sitting here. This is all I got. So uh, that's my one minute video. But yeah, I'm happy to talk more um, in depth about a couple bodies of work. And then, so do we want to go for, we don't need to watch this video again. No. <laughs> and then, right, Jaden has a process uh, Hold video. Hold on, let's skip, can, let's skip ahead of Jaden's video. All right, we can admire that. There we go. Um, yeah, so I thought tonight I would just dive into two bodies of work. And I thought I would start with, um, the series um, that's represented as part of Objects USA 2020. Um, and I, I tend to work in series and sort of investigate these systems of information and, and kind of dive in and find my way. So um, the first system, actually go back and um, I'll just reference. So the first system I'm investigating here is aura photography. So this is an actual um, aura photograph of, of myself with my daughter, my blondie daughter there on my lap. and. Um, and or an aura photograph uh, camera is when you actually place your hands on these sensors and it sends a reading into a computer that then translates that information into color wavelengths and sort of produces this computer output. So it's not that it's not the illusion of an aura around you, but it's a, it's a computer gener generated image. Um, so that's super fascinating. But what got me as an artist is that when interpreting these auras, there's a really precise uh, color meaning. So each color is prescribed a meaning and then the placement of color. So there's this rich language um, that really interested me. So I realized that, um, and we'll, we can go to the next image, that if I, if I have this narrative and then I apply the rules of color uh, of aura photography interpretation to that narrative, I can kind of reverse engineer an aura. So that's exactly what I did. I went around and, um, reverse engineered auras for the subjects of famous paintings. Um, and so Mona Lisa's aura is the work represented in the show. I think the next image is an installation shot there so you can see the scale of it. Um, and yeah, how I work is, um, you can look at the next image. Um, so I start with, you know, famous painting, George Washington. And I research, you know, his personality, uh, the really, you know, the moment of that painting, historical painting, and I, I create a, a historical narrative about that. And then I go ahead and apply the rules of aura photography interpretation to that. 
Um, and so Washington, you know, was a very methodical reason, man. He really made step-by-step um, -step decisions. He was also in a lot of physical pain um, during his lifetime. Anyways, through this rule of color uh, determination, I, I came up with this aura. And what I love is that I was like, well, that is sort of strikingly George Washington's aura. So I come at it um, sort of backwards, but it's a real fun way to play with color. I How I create these auras is with dye, I slowly um, layer by layer build up the color. Uh, I hand dye the fabric um, and apply the fabric. And then once I do that, let's see, we can go to the next image and sort of see how that works. So here's Whistler's mother. Um, so again, I determine this story, apply the rules of color to it, create this aura very, um, slowly building up uh, layer by layer this dot, these um, hand dyed layers. And then I take the, in the next image you can see, I take the original painting and project that onto um, the fabric and you can see a stitch silhouette of, of Whistler's mother here. So the original painting is referenced here and sort of a presence of the physical body. And it's interesting as I was putting these slides together, I was thinking, you know, one thing that really captivated me as an artist was this way to play with color and to play and to really create abstractions, like almost tricking myself through a kind of logic into a, an intuitive way of working. Um, but it's interesting, I was realizing like I could have stopped there, right? I could have just played with color, played with the dyes, see how they reacted to the fabric. But there was something about um, then um, it's sort of almost giving weight to the object by creating these, these quilted layers that I sew together that really changed it. Um, for one thing, it mimicked in aura photography, right? You have this computer generation of color and then that Polaroid that you saw of me and my daughter was superimposed on it so that it echoes that two layers. But it also, um, for one, you know, it changes it from a two dimensional surface to a three, it, it becomes sculptural, right? It, the, if, the, if you can see in the next one, you know, the details, you can see these shadows, mm -hmm. it becomes a, a slightly more sculptural object, but it also, um, it has a presence, it has a weight. So, um, you yeah, know, I'm I was gonna because... say when you, when you, when you enter, when you see these works in the gallery, I'll just tell, you know, that the, they really do have an, an energy to them. And, and I think people really have responded. I'll just go back quickly and then I'll, I didn't mean to cut you off, but this piece, which no, is go for it. in this show, now Mona Lisa's aura, every person that walks past this stops. And it's interesting because the, so an aura photograph is really capturing some sort of energy and you feel that you've transcended that into this three-dimensional quilted object. And that's what I think is so fascinating. People are completely fascinated by, by this and they don't understand it at all at first, but then once you read the, the title and I think you see that too, like here's George Washington and as soon as you read the title and you see the image, it it all sort of comes together in your head, which I think is so amazing. Um, oh, thank you. But, well, and that was what um, that was the real surprise of this um, this journey for me. Like I said, I sort of investigate these systems, and I don't know where I'm headed. And so it was just an exploration of color and how we attach meaning to color that really intrigued me. But I was surprised at the outcome to realize that these felt like sincere portraits. Like they really had some kind of presence um, that I was not seeing coming. Like I said, George Washington's aura feels like George Washington's aura. There's like a full length uh, Velasquez Philip IV on the left there. Um, and then an older Philip IV on, on the right, that smaller one, uh, Van Gogh's and that. So yeah, it just each one has its, um, its character, which again, really surprised me. Um, but then I also think that stitching, um, that, that my own investment of time and, um, and like really crafting it into an object versus sort of a two dimensional surface of color, that there's some transformation that happens, uh, happens there, um, mm -hmm. which is good, which is good because like, um, in, uh, I actually like camouflage the thread color. So like every two inches I'm changing in Mona Lisa's or like that blue to a lighter blue and then pink. So I was like, if this isn't doing something, I'm, I'm just driving myself crazy for nothing. Um, but yeah, that was a really fun process of, I mean, as an artist, we don't always know, oh, well, really, truly, right? We never know where we're headed, but seeing where these mm -hmm. um, paths take uh, take you is, is an interesting how, and fun and part of it. How long have, has this, how long were you working on this particular series? I know you have I, a new series now that you're working on, which we'll see. Right, right. No, I generally like carve out a year or two and I just sort of dive into that. So for this like year or two span of time and then 
I mean, a classic, um, just as Warhol had these different iterations of, of Marilyn Monroe, I, I died two iterations. Um, and that's also an interesting thing in the aura photography shop, right? There's a lot of like before and after, or like uh, I've, I've gotten my aura photographed multiple times and it, cha it shifts and changes. So there's also that way that it's a manifestation of, of clarity and, you know, struggle and, and all those sort of things. So anyways, it was fun to do uh, two iterations of the same subject. Um, but yeah, I really sort of dive into uh, whatever it is I'm investigating. There's an, usually an intensive research process. And then of course, a, a play with the materials that happens. Um, and then, you know, and then I move on to the next idea, which um, I think the next slide, it will, and I'll talk about um, just the second body of work here tonight um, to show another way that I work. For one thing, black and white, um, and, you know, leaving color aside and, and going for the graphic line of the stitch thread. But um, this project measure um, was an opportunity I got at the Radcliffe Institute and I chose to focus the exhibition on the life and work of astronomer Henrietta Leavitt. And she worked at the Harvard College Observatory at the turn of the 19th century studying glass plate photographs of the night sky. And through that study, she gave us, she gave us astronomers the first tool to measure the distance to faraway stars and uh, which just had enormous impact. Within 10 years of her discovery of, of, of providing this tool, we deter, you know, astronomers determined the shape and size of our Milky Way galaxy and then determined that galaxies existed beyond our own. It was almost like, I th they feel like this scaffolding, this literal construction of the space around us. Uh, again, this three-dimensional imagining of space, um, sort of orienting ourselves within that is such an interesting unfolding to me. Uh, but what particularly, one, broke my heart, but also made me want to commemorate her life and work was that Levitt died before the re reverberations of her finding were known. Um, so what I chose to do was, um, I, of course, created my own system. I did, um, using star calculation software, I determined the stars above the place of her birth on the morning of her birth, and then the stars on the evening of her death above the place of her death. And I, tra and I played time forward. So these are stars sort of tracking across the sky and I using the grayscale. So I have my numbering system here and you can see I'm starting to like chalk out the, the, the trajectory of each star. Um, and then um, using the grayscale, I fade the, um, you can see in the next image, I think. So these star trails sort of fade and disappear into the, into the background. So the stars actually burn out with the rising of the sun on the day of her birth. And then they return back into view on the evening of her death. And so um, the next image, again, you can see that diptych in the gallery. So this birth and death diptych and this sort of this curtain of light sort of pulled back. Um, and so quilts, of course, are historically a way to commemorate, um, you know, significant moments in our lives or, or belief systems or an individual. So it was a logical uh, format to sort of hold and commemorate this woman's life. And so I wanted this monumental feeling that these sort of black monolithic, this presence to commemorate her life and work. But what was also really important to me was that space in between, um, because uh, there is an acknowledgement of the significance of her finding, but she built that finding through small repeated acts. Um, and just as the quilt is, is constructed through small repeated acts, I want to honor the meaning held in that, that that is significance, that it's not just, um, you know, being, being uh, someone wedded to craft and to material and process, that that process is just as significant as the final culmination. Um, so that space in between was a really important presence to hold as part of the work. Um, wow. and, then um, and then across the gallery, it was on, on the opposite wall was this um, body of work. And these odd shapes um, are based on a contemporary cosmological finding. And it's, um, I won't go too into it, but it's the largest um, known structure in our cosmos. And it, 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 and it speaks to how the gravitational boundary for how galaxies flow towards a basin of attraction. So these strange shapes are actually rotated views of the same gravitational boundary are, are that we are a part of us and our galaxy plus 100,000 others. So it's this gravitational flow. And I like, but like at the heart of this finding, which was, you know, probably within the decade that Levitt's like foundational tool was at it was its heartbeat. So the fact that, that these two walls sort of speak bridge this span of a century that her work is still at this like sort of, um, connective tissue, like I think if you see the next image, I do think of this imagery as a kind of sy synaptic, you know, connection, this um, 
that there's we're taking these large um, you know these spans of time and oceans of space and then of course the hand um, and the presence of our individual lives is that connective tissue um, you know tying it all together. So those are the two bodies of work I wanted to focus on tonight. I will um, send it over to Jaden to take it. I think well, you're next. Take it away. That, or uh, go ahead, Evan, if that. you have any questions. Well, yeah. I'm going to just say that that was, that was fantastic. And I, I really appreciate you explaining that because it goes so far beyond um, you know, the understanding uh, normally of what people would see when they, you know, giving me the context is so important. But I love how you have really transcended the the work, you know, beyond the, the the idea, and this is exactly why Objects USA is so important in the, this current exhibition, but also the original exhibition, is the idea of what craft really means, and it's not necessarily uh, about the craft itself. That's just a, a tool. It's just a, a material choice to create this incredible body of work. And although it's all related, that that's so critical here. So I think this your your work just does that, you know, beautifully. Um, I'm going to back up to your video, uh, Jaden. So then we're going to jump around a little bit. I apologize for the kind of the way this is laid out. Um, Dude, that was so amazing. Like, yeah, just learning so much about um, all of that research and study that you did is so, so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, thank you. All right. So, Jaden, we're going to show, see a little video here. It's short. So, yeah, and I I will to to Anna's um, statement about not having a video. I had to I had to enlist my wife to help me get a TikTok of of uh, caliber to get into get on get on the Instagram. Um, so um, this is just a quick little shot of kind of the the quick steps that well the long uh, steps that kind of all go into making one of these large platters that I make. Um, yeah, I thought it would be good for people just to see because the process is so interesting and so unique and it doesn't obviously end there but we want i wanted people to see that um before you got into the the the, the rest so let's now jump back the other yeah, way my my first i think photo my first couple images will show you a little bit um kind yeah of how, that, how that goes um, so th this is the work that's in the current objects usa exhibition um yep, totally um so, yeah and so um most of my work is kind of focusing on how we use objects to commemorate moments. Um, my family has been selling tombstones for the last uh, couple decades, or no, a couple uh, hundred years. Um, and so it's always been kind of a thing that I have been uh, drawn to is how we actually kind of take these obelisks to denote uh, a person and uh, kind of decide uh, that uh, they're their name, uh, maybe a couple quotes, and their date is kind of how um, they're remembered. Um, and so I've, I've always thought that that was really interesting, that that's all distilled into one, um, one uh, very small little bit of information that a whole life can kind of get taken taken down to that. So um, as a metalsmith, I was always drawn to kind of what are the metal objects that we live with. Um, and so uh, when I first started on this body of work, oh, perfect, uh, Evan, uh, let's stay here for a second. Um, I, I kind of was really interested in this material, the silver plated platters, um, because it is this commemorative object, like they, us they usually were given for um, gifts of um, retirement or wedding gifts and things like that. They, they've become like the quintessential image of what metal is to a kind of a broad swath of people. Um, and what I kind of love about them is that they're kind of faking reality a little bit or, or, um, or history. Um, there's kind of, they're silver plated. So they're actually not actually um, silver. They're not like the most um, uh, monetarily uh, valuable thing in the world. Um, they're also kind of die pressed so they're press molded and then the the what looks like an engraving is actually just pressed onto the metal um through the through the uh, manufacturing and i just think that that's kind of really interesting that we've taken these kind of uh very historical imagery and we've we've kind of delineated delineated them to the masses and um the final thing that i think is the the last value that i don't think it's enough credit is the care or lack thereof of these objects for the people who used to own them. And so that first uh, collection um, was a body of work called Mitosis. And so I, I was collecting up so many of these things and I was seeing that they were all the exact same platter, um, but then how they were used actually kind of makes them very different. So they probably were made at the exact same time, but through their history, they've started to take on these different uh, 
uh, tarnishes, scratches, and things like that. And so I made this uh, set of six that slowly um, kind of shows that mitosis of, of kind of falling, away, like becoming two different entities as they grow. Um, and so the next slide is um, kind of what it entails to put these pieces of metal together. Um, so I do a process called marrying of metal. Um, and so it's really um, pretty much just building a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and so it's um, my tools are a jeweler saw and an extra fine Sharpie. Um, and so it's just kind of passing one back and forth over the each other um, over and over until um, they fit perfectly together. And so if you go to the next slide, um, then you'll see kind of what that looks like. So I use um, a low temperature solder to connect these things together. Um, I always kind of say that I, I'm kind of like a, a, a metalsmith liar, like a, a, a cheat of some kind, <laughs> because um, it's I can't high temp because the plating will sometimes start to burn off. And also that patina uh, will get lost over, um, over that kind of heat process. Um, so um, I, I've been thinking a lot about how it's a, a little bit like stained glass too, that you're kind of filling in those little marks um, and kind of parts as you go along. Um, and so the next slide uh, will show you- There's something that I was just gonna point out too, that th this particular slide is such a great uh, detail because these moments where these metals connect is one of the most exciting parts for me, at least when I see these pieces, because from photographs, it's hard to see that, that detail. So this is a great, slide yeah. because it, you can see the convergence of all these shapes it's almost as if it's you know completely like a storm happening between these these traditional uh you know motifs all of a sudden being turned backwards and forwards and connecting in ways they're not supposed to it's kind of a, yeah. it's really interesting Thank, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to put that in there because I do think when you see the bigger pieces, they look almost textural, you know, like they just kind of look like color variations, kind of like what Anna was doing, um, auras kind of. Um, and so um, it's, uh, I wanted to kind of show kind of the detail that uh, hopefully people at the um, at the gallery will get to see. Uh, so I've been collecting, uh, I'll show you a few platters later on that are kind of much bigger, but as I've been doing this process, I've kind of get to see how many of these specific, each specific platter has been made. Um, and so I've kind of had this whole sp specimen kind of collection growing of spoons and platters. Um, I think I'm up to 30 to 35 of just different kind of um, specimens of kind of two different platters that are exactly the same company, but then how they've been cared for over time changes them. Like um, the one on the right, I, ha I have another iteration of it where the other one has been, I found at a junkyard and it had been run over by a semi truck. Um, and so just kind of like how that notion of like one has been cared for forever and has been washed so many times that the patina, like the plating is coming off and another has been discarded. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I think that that's this kind of a beautiful definition of our communal kind of values and meanings that we're all adding our little individual touches to our kind of communal uh, definition of, of history. So, and you've been working on this series for quite some time. I, these are from 2013. This is an yeah. early slide. And I think that I, I first saw your work in around that time, probably at Design Miami, or yeah. one of those fairs. Um, so it's great to see that this is a body of work that you're really exploring. Like it, it's, it's, it's great, and especially these, these early pieces are great to see. Yeah. Um, I've actually been working in this material for almost a decade. So I haven't bought a brand new piece of metal in, in 10 years. And I and I my running joke with the, with the materials that I'm not winning. Like I, I buy this all on eBay and the articles are just showing up even more and more and more as people just don't want them in their life anymore. Um, and so uh, as I've gotten further along in the material, um, I've, I've kind of started to build larger and larger. So um, this is a six feet by I think three feet or it's almost four feet. Um, and so as I've been kind of uh, building, I've, I've really been thinking about that notion of these things as, as used to be functional objects that they actually um, used to be used for tea service. And, and as we've kind of lived with them longer and longer, they've definitely become more commemorative, you know, like everybody has their their piece that maybe is sitting on um, a, uh, you know, a dining table or something like that, but it's not really used actually for what it's for what it's made for. And so I, I even think that that kind of notion of it as an object is kind of starting to fall apart, um, that this kind of like um, 
this thinking of it as almost like a textile that it's kind of starting to um, be eaten away by moths um, and kind of falling falling apart as as it goes down. Um, I even kind of like to think of them as kind of silt um, that they're kind of uh, the ornamentation becomes the layering rather than the actual object itself. Um, so the next slide. <clears throat> and they've def they've definitely just gotten bigger. Um, I really, uh, really loved Anna's kind of talk about science, like science really plays a role um, in kind of how I look at stuff. And so I start to think of these as definitely little bacterias that are kind of just kind of in um, invert inadvertently kind of going out into our second hand shops and then getting kind of grabbed and and sent to another location. Um, so this is, uh, I think there's around 70 of them. Um, and kind of really trying to keep those edges of the platter to kind of show that kind of little, um, almost like nuclei of each one um, and how they're kind of uh, building into their own little worlds. Um, and yeah. then the next one is the biggest one to, to date. Um, this one's 25 feet by eight feet. Um, and this was, this was a, I, I really wanted to try to see how, how big I could get and how they could kind of become their own little, um, that little um, spaces in between each and how they're starting to even kind of go into one another, kind of uh, reaching out for one another. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how the, the larger they get, how the, they become less defined, the, the, the individual objects start to sort of really meld into one another and disappear in a way. Totally. And I think, um, Evan, you, you were actually yesterday we met and you were saying that like, it's kind of a shame you don't get to see like uh, every single one of those has those little low temp solder um, marings that kind of connect each piece of those together. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing I also want to say about this material is um, these uh, are commemorative objects, and that's actually how the trophy began. Um, the trophies that we see in all of our, you know, sports teams and things like that. It actually was, um, it was objects for the home. You know, most of them were thank you gifts for retiring um, and things like that. And that they've slowly become that definition of trophy has gone from altruistic to um, to um, competitive, and then the kind of now it's turned into this participatory kind of thing where we have all these plastic trophies for everybody, um, best dad, you know, um, uh, you know, best base, the baseball team, uh, just be, being a part of the part of the game, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of obviously the recycling aspect of this is something that people immediately respond to, and like you said before, everybody sort of has one of these in their life or has had one in their life if their grandmother had one or, you yeah. know, but it's like a sort of lost art, you know, form at this point, or, or it has become somewhat valueless in the, in the way that it doesn't have, it's not silver, it's not worth really anything. And it's also out of fashion in many ways, like this kind of object, we don't use it in contemporary society anymore, but you found this incredible way of yeah. renewing that. Um, and um, and I hope my, I hope this body of work um, strikes a balance of like, of it, and it's, it's okay that it's kind of falling out of favor, you know, that I think that it's kind of, um, our, our society has found a new way of looking at, um, community and, and kind of coming together in a different way. And I, I think that is also powerful and beautiful in, in its own right. Um, and so that I wanted to kind of show the larger pieces and then I wanted to show kind of this group of pieces that have also kind of emerged from this. Um, and so most of my work is about history and how, you know, like all of us kind of add our little touches to that history. Um, and as I've worked in this material, I've collect kept everything that I've ever, um, I've done one recycling uh, run um, when I moved, but everything else is still in my studio. And I, I like to, I, I think about that material that it's also this loss of history that I'm, I'm kind of taking what I need from it. I make these big sculpt, these big platters, and then this big pile of little scraps kind of start to um, kind of com commune behind me or around me uh, on the floor. And so um, next slide, um, this, these are some pieces that I've built from kind of collecting up um, the little bits of uh, specific parts. So um, this ends piece um, is all of, 
I collected up all of the um, pot metal rims. So that decorative edge on some of the platters is pot metal to kind of make it look more, more thick and um, potent than it actually is. Another kind of lie <laughs> in the mass production. Um, and so I collected up every single one that was in my studio and I started just kind of to solder them into a loop and, and really thinking about um, history. Mark Twain's quote, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, and so kind of wanting to make this single continuous loop of um, ornamentation that is kind of creating that loop over loop over loop and and it's kind of growing but it still kind of hits on the same little notes as you go along and the next slide um, so uh, along the same note, um, some of the other rims are actually um, just rolled edge. Um, it's just sheet metal that is kind of made to look like the other stuff that we just saw. Um, and so I kind of started to cut those out and kind of form them into this nice little um, kind of tuft um, or coil um, to kind of give them some kind of dimension. So this is a new slide. I hadn't seen this slide before, but this is great to see. So now this is obviously a 2020 piece. This is a relatively new work. So now you're starting to take these objects and physically change their form, not just in your previous way, but actually they're taking a completely different form, which is really, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There, um, yeah, I wanted to start to kind of, um, I think as I've as those platters got bigger and bigger, um, Evan, you said this really nice thing that the, the material starts to kind of become more broad um, spectrum. You don't really get to see that ornamentation, and so um, this I think has led to this kind of body of work where I'm really thinking more of it as a material rather than um, kind of that com that communal object of um, we've all uh, had to clean that one platter that our grandparents had, you know. Um, Next slide. So this is a little bit older, um, but this was from a body of work um, where I, I, I'm going to show a couple etching. Maybe I won't. I, I do a print process. I can't quite remember, but uh, I do a print uh, edition with this material. And so I actually used all of the um, cuttings that I did from the prints. Um, I was kind of doing this alter print plate edition, um, and I made this kind of nice cloth to um, that was the exact same size as the paper that I was using. And then, so yeah, I did, I did put a uh, photo in. Um, and so I do a print, uh, a print um, project. So I do a donation service that if anybody ever donates a platter to me, I'll print it for you as a thank you. Um, and so this is an intaglio print. And so this kind of harkens back to um, my childhood at the tombstone business that this was my job was to go out um, and kind of do rubbings of, um, of different, um, uh, tombstones for the family so that, you know, if uh, a family really loved a tombstone that they saw in, um, in the, the park, they would, uh, I would do the rubbing, and then we'd have all of the dimensions and stuff like that. And so <clears throat> what I'm doing is I'm just cutting out the bottom of the plate and then inking it just like an intaglio. Um, and the best thing I ever heard, this was a, such a happy accident, was um, I did these print editions, I was, I was just pretty like, I'm not a printmaker, so I was just kind of trying my best. And so this lady comes up and she said, well, this is actually where print history begins is in, um, in metalsmithing. And so she tells me the story that actually um, she, uh, um, shields and stuff like that, like armor was actually printed so that when armor went off to war, uh, that was probably never coming back because the, the um, warrior would die. And so the, the uh, armor would stay put. Um, and so this was the way that you would show your engravings to people. And so um, that's kind of how I look at this. Now that she told, told me that story, I'll, I'll kind of uh, steal it. Um, <clears throat> is, um, is I kind of think of them as the final image of when that had value to the owner that had just given it to me. And so to kind of connect the two up, this is all the flowers from my uh, floor. Um, making this kind of wreath. Um, and then the wreath slowly disappears over time. Um, but in the disappearance, um, you can't fully see it in the image. There's an embossing of the actual wreath itself. Um, and so that kind of shows that negative space of what's lost. And then finally, um, this is, I was in a table show here in uh, Richmond. Um, and so this is a table leaf um, made from the silver plated platters. Um, 
I, I just think the table leaf is just this weird commemorative object that has just lives all in our houses. Like my family's personally lives underneath the spare bedroom. Um, but like once it comes out, it means that it's like a, a moment of importance. Um, and so I think it, it's its own trophy in its own capacity. So I think that's it. Oh, yeah. And great. Thank you. That was really interesting to, to hear. And, and the, the tombstone business, what a funny because the looking at those platters now, knowing that your family was in the tombstone business in a way, they almost feel like those, those old, you know, discarded things are sort of tombstones in a way of the, like the decorative arts of that era. Yeah. Kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so this is another uh, new work of Anna. So we're going to end the kind of talk with the, with these guys on, on, I wanted to ask them what they're working on now and what's coming up next. Um, so we can share some of that with, with the audience. And uh, so Anna, do you want to tell us about yeah, this? Yeah, I'll just talk about a couple drawings. So for one thing, most notably, I am drawing these days after 20 years of making quilts and that being my not just primary, but only form of, you know, the only medium that I was exploring, I've shifted to drawing. But I think one part of that could be interesting as part of this conversation is how, for example, a drawing practice that is informed by 20 years of, of quilt making, um, right off the bat, you could be like, well, this is essentially a patchwork quilt. So um, this is a large scale drawing that I made based on emojis. As I said, like, I, li I like to explore systems of information. So um, I've drawn to emojis how we sort of collectively and individually shape meaning in this new visual form. Um, but yeah, that uh, that I essentially made this patchwork quilt of um, rep playing with repetition and pattern. Um, you, you saw the monkeys in the previous slide, and then there's this sort of just um, repetition of of sugar, essentially like sugar in all its forms in emoji form. Um, but you know, this has a shout out to the pattern decoration movement and, and the ways that we can play with shape and, and repetition. It also has a callback, you know, strangely to that, the, that those stitching, those quilts I stitched in honor of Henrietta Levitt that, um, you know, that what is the act of repetition? Like what meaning lies in the repetition of an act? And so it may be strange, but like drawing a cupcake again and again and again is its own sort of relationship that you have to sort of navigate same as any repeated gesture or action in one's life um so and then the final like uh, at the end uh, there's this whole narrative i call it this like operatic score of like this like the jester of the monkey is introduced in the first act and then there's this sort of play of repetition and then the final act is this sort of see no evil hear no evil monkey um and then uh, this is the drawing series I'm working on now. I mean, I have to say this show, it just must be in my consciousness because I'm now like exclusively looking at the objects category and emojis. And um, partly I just read Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter, which really has an interesting sort of idea of agency of how, um, and thinking about Jade and like your relationship to objects, how with Heidegger, you know, it, it slides along that, that that relationship between an object and a thing. So, so it comes with a certain function, but then it sort of slips back. I mean, I love how those platters come with a history, come with a material, you know, and then it sort of slips away. And, and so that, that, there's that dance. And with emoji objects, it's the same sort of thing. Like they come, they get accepted by Unicode through this really rigorous uh, proposal. We have to justify its existence as an emoji object. And then it just slides right back into sort of its thingness. Um, and so, I mean, and then I sort of am creating my own patterns and meaning with this sort of mending and tending and um, rupture, these these sort of another sort of essentially making emoji quilts through these drawings. Um, and I chose uh, not only like the, you know, we can choose the black background on our phones, but we can choose, I, I wanted to sort of suspend these objects in space, like and really see them as, these strange objects and what our relationship is to them. And then that's a sort of a terrible segue, but in terms of what I'm working on next and, and sort of heading into objects in space, I just um, got word that I am receiving a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. So in the fall, I'm gonna be heading back to cosmology and studying dark matter at the Smithsonian wow. Astrophysics Observatory and, um, and just sort of seeing where that um, road leads. So yeah, that's what I'm up to these days. Wow. Congratulations. That's thank you. Thanks. I'm that's thrilled. amazing. Um, okay, so Jaden, this is your yes. new work here. 
Yeah, this is a couple of new pieces that I, I um, made in the last uh, year um, that I've been kind of um, thinking a lot about. And so um, I've been thinking again about commemoration, but what are the tools that we do in our kind of everyday life? Um, living in um, Richmond, Virginia, I'm, I'm near a lot of these kind of uh, very uh, controversial and really uh, challenging uh, monuments that thankfully have been kind of been taken down. Uh, over the last uh, year, um, but thinking really about kind of that uh, imagery and kind of how it can affect people um, and how this also has been kind of in the tombstone industry as well, that these objects have kind of always been, um, this kind of banner has always kind of been the marker for the name or the, the quotes, um, but what can that look like um, when it's just taken off of an object and kind of pinned? Um, and so this is two uh, pieces that I kind of just um, did. And then I've actually been kind of doing some drawing too, um, um, thinking about kind of silver as a material um, that the silver plated platters are, you know, very thin silver just on top of copper or brass. Um, and so I've been actually been doing these silver point drawings on paper of kind of these banners um, or this kind of tapestry that I've been doing. Um, so this is all just um, silver point um, onto paper to kind of see what that would look like as kind of this like x-ray of these like uh, worn down um, ba uh, banner pieces or, or kind of cloth pieces. Um, so I definitely am kind of now looking um, very uh, love Anna's kind of kind of thought process. So I, I definitely feel um, kin uh, akin to it. Wow, that's great. I think that was our last slide. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm sorry, we might have run over mm. in terms of time a little bit, but that was just incredibly interesting to hear. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, and I guess now we are going to open this up to any questions, right? Is that good? Yeah, so we have uh, one question so far from Brian. Anna, do you have any ideas you could share about your use of emojis as a craftsperson versus John Baldessari's take on emojis as a fine artist? Oh man, you're gonna make me go against John Baldessari. I did see that print series in New York when it came out. Um, and, and I love other bodies of, you know, I'll just say that I was, I had that exact feeling where I, I didn't feel like there was a trade. I mean, there's some play obviously in that series. And so I won't really go into that that work as much, but I, I didn't did feel like it wasn't this layered. I mean, his work is so layered and nuanced in other ways. And that one was sort of, sort of a, a fun play. But um, to me, like introducing the hand into, um, you know, having this relationship that we have our slick screens that are sort of, distance from and then we have our our bodies and our lives and, and this intimate intimacy and then seeing how that can sort of loop that it's not um that that to me is an interesting exchange and not just sort of like oh there's the digital world and the real world and as a craftsperson i'm trying to anchor it in the real i mean that's part of the equation but then i'm also seeing how we can send in like how intimacy is present in our phones and how um and how the, our digital life, you know, the digital world sort of informs our, 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 our quote unquote real lives that there's not a boundary there. So to me, I was trying to sort of um, layer it. And, and for me personally, that, that print series felt a little flat. So I'll just, I'll just state it bold and simple <laughs> as that. <laughs> yeah, so I'll invite everybody to put your questions in the chat. I have a question, Evan, about coming to visit the gallery. Are you guys doing timed entry? How does that work right now? So we are open to um, the public. You do not need to make an appointment, although you are more than welcome to do so. And you, you can on the website, um, which I think we shared in the chat, the Objects USA um, website, you can, you can book an actual appointment. But we are open now, um, regular hours, and we are open to walk-ins. Um, so please come. Um, the show is, like I mentioned before, up until the middle of September. We're keeping it up through the Armory Show weekend um, to hopefully capture uh, the last few people coming through. A lot of people are just coming back to New York for the first time after being away for a year, which is nice. Uh, we've actually been getting a pretty robust um, attendance um, pretty 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 regular, regularly now, which is nice. That's great. 
And yeah. what does the gallery have coming up next since we now know what the artists have coming up next? Uh, we have a pretty busy schedule upcoming. Um, we are going back to the fair circuit, which we haven't done for almost two years now. So that's uh, a kind of exciting. Uh, we're doing the uh, Armory show, as I mentioned, in September. Um, and we're going to be doing the Salon Art and Design Fair in November. And then we're going to be doing Design Miami in December. So the rest of the year, we have three fairs. Um, and then in the gallery opening in the fall, we're going to have Katie Stout, who is in, in Objects USA, her second solo show with us, uh, and a contemporary Brazilian designer named Zanini De Zanini. It'll be his first solo show with us. And we're doing a historical uh, exhibition on the work of Werner Panton, who was one of our earliest exhibitions. Actually, it's, it's going to be the 20th anniversary of our first Panton show, uh, which we opened in October of 2001, a month after September 11th, which was wow. crazy um, because our gallery is about 10 blocks from the Trade Center. And so we had been closed for a solid month. Um, people had to get past tanks and police lines and things like that to get to our gallery, which still smelled like burning plastic at the time. Um, so we're commemorating that with an exhibition and Panton is all about positivity. Um, so that's where we can, you know, end it is on positivity, right? Because this, this whole exhibition has been such a positive experience for us as a gallery, um, but also just, I think everyone involved, the idea of, of something that represents America in a way that uh, maybe we weren't thinking about it uh, for the last many years, um, the idea of a country of immigrants. This is what this show really represents. And, and it did historically, and it does today, uh, many first generation uh, people from other places participating in, in both exhibitions. It was really important to be very inclusive of, of that. And, and the, the original show did a great job of having a fairly equal balance of male, female, um, and incorporate a lot of other, you know, people of color. And, and so the, the, the idea that we're just getting started, we've only just scratched the surface where hopefully this, this is, is going to continue. So this is Objects USA 2020. I look forward to Objects USA 20, whatever it's going to continue. Um, so we're just getting started. That's great. We definitely yeah. at Craft Now like to acknowledge how accessible craft is in all cultures uh, throughout the world. And it's something that um, brings us all together. Yeah. Uh, Clara Hollander says, excellent presentations. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. It's yeah, been a thank pleasure. You. It's been a pleasure to learn more about your work and spend this hour with you. I'd like to invite everyone in the audience to learn more about our programs at craftnowphila.org and follow us on social media. And please consider a donation so that we can continue to bring programs like this to audiences and advocate for the sector. And just so you know, we are taking a break in July and August, uh, but we will be returning in September. So with that, I'd like to invite everyone to unmute themselves and say hello and um, speak to your fellow gallery goers. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Uh, um, um, uh, we really love watching the presentation, Anna uh, and uh, Jaden. Um, it's interesting, and I, I was struck by the Whistler uh, reference uh, because the subtitle was, of course, portrait in gray and black. So the whole sense of values, as opposed to the obvious picture of a woman, uh, was an interesting idea. And at the same time, uh, in that same period of time, Alexander Scriabin created a whole body of, of, of comp compositions that were based on color. And he, he had things, uh, he sensed that there was uh, color values to, uh, to particular uh, patterns of music. And he based a whole series of his compositions. So that might be of in an interest to explore for you as well. And, and, um, and Jaden, uh, when I was watching um, your, that first piece, I kept seeing pictures of uh, Utagawa Hiroshige's uh, prints from the Edo period, uh, like these waves uh, of Japanese printmaking that I thought were so beautiful. And I was really uh, struck by that. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting because the human mind works in such interesting ways. I mean, things that occur to us now have occurred to somebody else every, ever, ever, and ever in the past. And we kind of re rediscover these things. I mean, 
I remember uh, Sheila Hicks spent a great deal of time at the uh, Instituto in, um, uh, in Mexico. Um, and um, a lot of her early weaving was informed by her studies of uh, folk art of the Americas, of the, uh, of the um, uh, area of uh, Mexico where, uh, where these things were done and also South America. And you know, so we find ways of, of re referencing these things. I mean, when I was watching Anna's okay. images of, um, <laughs> of the uh, Mojis, I, we kept thinking of Wayne Tebow's paintings. <laughs> Cakes and- A lot you know, of sugar. These, these, right, references, right. these references are really wonderful because when you have those experiences, you, you kind of put them together and they, they form an interesting kind of continuity. And my wife has just told me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else needs a turn too. You know, you can go on, don't you, for a long time. <laughs> I, I so appreciate these connections that you're making. And it reminds me of my experience being this exhibition that it's not just a, a, a linear narrative of history, that, that there's a way that the shows like this, we can loop back and, and sort of there is this way that these right. different practices can feed. And, and yeah, so the, it is not just a, a straight line, but this way that it's layered and layered and layered. So I appreciate your, your right. co contributions. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I think it's, um, it, I think that's one of the best parts about uh, looking back at history is that you do get to see how much of a melding was happening um, along the way. It's not just a linear kind of thing. Well, well, the only thing, the only thing that hasn't changed in uh, uh, some uh, several million years of, uh, of making things is us. I mean, we are the same thing that a human being is from time immemorial, the first objects that you see when you go to the Met and see these wonderful antiquity pieces of these fertility symbols. And those potters that put their hands on those pieces and shape them are the same hands that we use today to do the same things. Yeah. So there's a continuity, right? A, a human yeah. continuity, which I love. Yeah, the hand. The hand is, is hand. the most yeah. ancient tool and the tool that we all use. And that, that is the thread throughout all of this. And that, that, that is incredible. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank any, you. Any other questions? I guess we're uh, well done. We can't wait to see you all in New York. <laughs> we're all coming. Uh, good. <laughs> Let me know. Um, we'll get the bus coming from Philadelphia. <laughs> I want to bring Ami. Ami wants to Well, come. thank you guys. I guess we'll say good night. Or thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Great to see all of you. We will see you again you in September. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Out.